everyone. Uh, my name is Irena, and today me and my friend Tim are going to talk about the, uh, as uh, <laughs> our friend already mentioned, we're going to talk about the project called Wikitongs, uh, which is a um, community of volunteers in more than 60 countries that are working to promoting linguistic diversity and um, uh, documenting um, every language in the world. That sounds very ambitious. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I would like to know uh, if anyone in the audience uh, if anyone here speaks any endangered uh, or maybe rare, like maybe indigenous language, anyone? What language do you speak? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it's spoken in France, right? Belgium. Belgium. Okay. Wow. Awesome. Um, anyone else? No. <laughs> well, um, do you know anyone who speaks an endangered language? You do? Okay, more of you. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> so maybe you could help us out in our cause today. We'll see. Um, so uh, my name is Irena, and I speak Northern Sami, uh, which is an indigenous language spoken by about 25,000 people in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, sorry, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and uh, Finland. Uh, and uh, um, I contributed to this project in 2015, if I remember correctly. Uh, by making a video of uh, me speaking that language and later I also recorded two other native speakers of other Sami languages and uh, Tim has also contributed with a few videos and he's gonna talk about that later um, yes uh, but first of all uh, so what we're trying to achieve is that we're trying to create the first uh, public uh, archive of every language in the world and our primarily goal for now is uh, oral and later we also want to create um, world, li world lists and um, uh, also so gather some um, written documents but for now it's oral and um, um, as you know um, yes this is how we work and um, um, sadly uh, what's uh, what's happening right now, the ling linguistic uh, situation right now, is that in about 80 years, uh, half of the world languages are expected to disappear. And uh, that's pretty um, dramatic. And, um, um, but there is some hope. <laughs> um, well, as you know, that in 18th and 19th century, uh, there have been uh, a lot of countries, especially in Europe, who had the um, policy of assimilation. Uh, for example, in Norway, the Sami people have been assimilated, like the local population um, in the north of Norway. Uh, they uh, were encouraged to speak Norwegian, or not only encouraged, but they were also uh, forced, they were sent to boarding schools, and they were forbidden uh, to speak uh, their native tongues in order so that they could become Norwegian. Uh, and um, now things look uh, brighter. Um, in the 90s, uh, European Union uh, has adopted the Charter of Minority and um, um, Minority and uh, Regional Languages, uh, and um, uh, like it helps to promote the uh, the rights of local communities, uh, as well as uh, in. Um, uh, Alaska in uh, 2014, I believe. <laughs> I see you recognize that one. <laughs> yeah, so in Alaska in 2014, uh, the local languages were, uh, became co-official with English. And the, uh, this is a picture of some activists uh, that participated in the process. Uh, also in Mexico in 2003, uh, there was uh, the federal government of Mexico lifted the ban of um, on indigenous languages, um, the use of indigenous languages in public schools. So a lot of things are improving, like it's getting better and better, but it's still not uh, perfect, unfortunately. And um, another example is Ghana, uh, which is actually trying to phase out English as uh, like English-only education, and instead they um, they opt for uh, uh, teaching in lo uh, in um, local languages because localized uh, education like uh, teaching in mother tongue um, helps the kids understand the material a lot better uh, than uh, the uh, when it's taught in English or other language that's foreign to them um, and um, 
Uh, a great example of our volunteers is uh, Polyglot Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is one of the most, most uh, linguistically diverse countries in the world, but I think that there are about one or two uh, official languages in Indonesia. Uh, so um, uh, these, <laughs> these guys are um, um, working in about 10 Indonesian provinces, and uh, they are um, um, they create very active and uh, uh, vibrant communities, and uh, they uh, also record a lot of videos. And they uh, they are partners of uh, Wikitongs, so they um, uh, contribute to the project. And it's great to see how uh, yeah the the indigenous uh, local communities themselves get involved in the process of preserving their languages. Um, let's see. Yes, uh, and as I was telling you about. Um, just a second. Where is it? Yes. Uh, I was telling you that uh, in 18th and 19th century, a lot of countries had assimilation uh, politics, and one of those countries in Norway. So I want to show you a little clip um, about. Uh, it's from a Norwegian documentary on Sami people, and uh, this particular thing is talking. Uh, this per uh, particular piece is talking about this uh, brave woman. She is a Sami activist in Russia, Murmansk, and. Um, um, it's, this one is in Norwegian, Russian, and Sami, but I'm going to be translating for you a little bit. Uh, so um, it's about her and her granddaughter. Let's see if it works. När barna barna Anna kommer på besök, är det ett av de stora lyspunkterna i livet till Nina. Anna bor i Norge och jobbar som urfolksrådgiver. Hon är starkt inspirerad av bestemorns kamp för att den samiska kulturen och språket ska överleva. So uh, she's saying that uh, this is her granddaughter and uh, she works in Norway and she's uh, greatly inspired by her uh, grandmother's um, uh, by her grandmother's wish uh, to preserve the language. And so now she uh, comes for a visit to her grandmother. Она прежде всего и вообще моя семья все вместе это прежде всего мои корни. When they greeted each other, they spoke in uh, Kildin Sami. Kildin Sami is spoken about uh, by about 600 people. Uh, it's spoken only in Russia, and it's a highly endangered language. language. So uh, later, the granddaughter Anna said that she and uh, uh, my family they represent my roots. Я прожила все то, что они прожили, то, что мы говорили сегодня, переселение, та боль, которая у них в сердце, она живет и во мне тоже. Я монокутик вайвшувчафт. Uh, the granddaughter said that I have lived through everything that they lived through and the pain uh, that they, they have, I also have it. And the grandmother says in Sami, uh, it, my heart hurts because my language is dying. It's <laughs> психологический стресс это большая историческая травма для самского народа so the grandmother also said that it's really really terrible she started crying and uh, the granddaughter is saying that it's a uh, great uh, psychological stress and it's a big trauma for the sami people and uh, for the young generation uh, like actually the language is uh, almost lost зашла можно сказать на данный момент сегодня уже потеря практически родного языка среди молодого поколения я говорю на самском языке я очень много старалась для того чтобы это было действительности и в реальности she says that but I speak the Sami language and I have worked a lot in order to preserve it and uh, I know Anna personally I had the chance to record a video with her uh, speaking killed in Sami so now we're gonna uh, see some of it uh, no, that's not it. There is an. Tir yelbete munnam le an. Munle sam ne zbog nekas. Munshen male. Urmans klanest. Roše pelja. Ja min kill kill sam kill. Det 
Дали мун юрта што дете ли човто важно е мун кил охпнове, ја мун кил вепсија, муто омотнеча. Okay, let's go back to the presentation and um, uh, yes. Um, so um, uh, as you see, the young people uh, start to get involved and it becomes more and more popular um, among young people as well, more prestigious to get the language back. Uh, because what happens, especially in the Sami community, that even though they speak the language, they are kind of not really comfortable with writing um, in it in social media. So it's important to create, uh, like kind of to make it cool, you know, to, to create uh, contact, uh, content that uh, people would consume otherwise in other languages. So next I want to show you a rap video, <laughs> which is made in Sami, entirely in Sami, and uh, the song goes like, uh, well, you'll see there is English translation, but he's basically talking about picking up, uh, picking, a girl, uh, picking up a girl in a bar, you know. So um, let's watch a bit of that. Uh, this is one of the most popular artists that we have in the Sami community. His name is Sling Craze, and he's from a small uh, village called Mace, uh, or Masi in Norway, uh, in Norwegian. And uh, he's really very, very popular. He has been recently invited to some uh, Canadian festivals. And um, uh, yeah, he's doing a lot of great stuff. And he sings uh, only in Sami, in Northern Sami. Uh, let's see. So, as you can see, yeah, like, um, it's what young people do, like, they listen to uh, rap music, they watch series, and, uh, um, yeah, they, they would like to do it in their native language. Uh, so, it's great that we have uh, people like uh, um, Sling Race, for example, uh, or also, um, what they do is that they make memes, <laughs> just like anyone else does. Here, uh, it's written that... Um, when you are a um, handicraft, uh, like when you do the handicraft, uh, doyar is a person who works with um, Sami art, uh, but uh, you, um, like you're kind of a bit shy to, uh, to show it. So uh, yeah, then you know, you kind of get upset. <laughs> so um, there, is, there is a lot of humor um, in the Sami culture, and um, um, there is a lot of, um, short video clips, sh short series, they uh, create contact so that, uh, content uh, so that um, anyone who wants to learn it, but also the people, the local people themselves can also consume it. Um, and um, I think that that was uh, it. And uh, I give, um, yeah, we were talking about social media. So now Timothy is going to talk uh, how the uh, local communities also uh, use social media in order to preserve their languages. There you go. Hello. Um, so for uh, Wiki Tongues, one of the major projects that the organization has done has uh, been to start creating a database of high quality personal narrative videos online. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of them on YouTube. There's a, a Wiki Tongues um, YouTube channel. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about how this sort of plays into the uh, whole notion of technology playing a really crucial role in sort of reversing some of the damage done to underrepresented languages. Um, so we're going to watch uh, one more video from here. This is a video from Wikitongues in the Cornish language. Cornish is a Celtic language um, that actually died out in the late 18th century. And in the early uh, 20th century, I believe, there was a revivalist movement. Um, it started out as a very 
uh, sort of esoteric niche activity, uh, but eventually people, uh, some people started raising children speaking Cornish as a first language. Uh, so this is Elizabeth and she's actually one of those uh, native speakers from that generation. So we'll just hear a little bit of her language. Irida Elizabeth Ovi ha trigis of in Kerno. Ha Kernoas um, of, a me goes and yes, Kernoic, Kernoagoras of. I thought me the lathus diski and yes, Kernoic ha me nepis a draw the safe blows, del debav. A thesa o mam o tiski. So this is Cornish. Um, one thing that's uh, important to think about is that. Uh, Elizabeth, I, uh, as far as I understand, is uh, in charge of several Facebook groups or other online um, uh, online groups for the Cornish language, and these have started to translate into actual physical meetups. So um, one of the problems when a language starts to not be supported by uh, the, the government or the dominant culture where it's spoken uh, is that it loses its grip on the public sphere and then eventually it has absolutely no public presence and once that happens it, it seems to be a matter of time that the language will die out. Uh, so what uh, internet communities have been able to do for underrepresented languages is actually create a, um, like a cyber public sphere and then use this as a platform to organize people to get them in touch with each other uh, even just to make people aware that there are other speakers out there uh, to help people learning languages, and then this can translate back into the physical world. Um, uh, so another example of uh, how this has sort of uh, translated into, into uh, changes in the real life world for the Cornish language, uh, you do start to see uh, signage used in Cornwall in the Cornish language. Um, but there also has been a TV commercial. Imurez, Nav Cavallo, a Kelly's Cornish ice cream, agu as tasty as. We're Il Cavos, agon suerio splan, nigger misc, honeycomb crunch, praline caramel, agon wev, berry eaten mess. If you gris old, gans clotted cream, dwarf bukis leo. Hans prif you moi, in morns nagas, a local supermarket. My hello, take home six new parlor flavors. Get on. Kelly's, Cornish for ice cream. So it's just a TV commercial and maybe people might think that's not actually so important, but for a language that was dead for over a hundred years, uh, the fact that a company actually saw the activity that's brewing around this language and decided that it would be uh, in their economic benefit to utilize the language in advertisement, I think speaks a lot towards uh, how far the, the language movement has, has come. Um, it also just increases visibility for the language, which is, is very important. Oops. Um, so one of my, one of my uh, personal reasons for working with Wikitongues is that uh, I'm an Irish speaker and uh, the Irish language has uh, never been in such a bad state as the Cornish language. Um, it has never lost native speakers, but it definitely has lost uh, its presence in the public realm uh, with the exception of the Gaeltacht areas in Ireland. And so for me, it, I have a, a personal interest in uh, promoting uh, endangered languages and underrepresented languages. Uh, and the things that I notice most nowadays is, uh, are also related to technology. So things like this slide, um, you know, there's now like texting slang in Irish because people are actually texting to each other in Irish. Um, the internet also has, has played a big role in sort of solidifying the Irish speaking community. So in Ireland, there are Gaeltacht areas, areas where Irish is um, spoken as a native language, but these areas are all separated from each other and there's actually more Irish speakers living outside of the Gaeltacht um, than inside they're just sort of uh, scattered around the country or around the world in diaspora as well. So there are organizations, uh, there's one in the States called Dalti Negeidga, Students of Irish, and that has had uh, for years a really active message board. Um, and that's another example 
of uh, an online community translating into uh, physical uh, real life activities. So they have meetups, uh, weekends, immersion weekends uh, for learners and speakers alike. Um, I think it's also uh, interesting from a heritage speaker perspective that when you start to have more, or really utilize uh, an online presence in a smart way, then you can also access uh, diaspora communities. So not only can you uh, create situations for people to use their language, but you can create situations for people to reclaim uh, a language that was perhaps lost in their family. So we're gonna move on to another language. Um, we'll go to the Patois. Um, so this is Jamaican Patois, and we'll just watch a little bit of a poem being read in Patois and then talk about it. And by Miss Lo, entitled Dry Foot Boy by Miss Lo. What wrong with Mary Dry Foot Boy? Them girl got him for mock. And when me meet him tara night, the boy give me a shock. Me tell him say him auntie and him cousin them send howdy. And ask him how him getting on. Him say, oh, jolly, jolly. Me start to feel so sorry for the poor bad lucky soul. Me think him come a foreign long, come catch bad foreign coal. Okay, so as you can probably tell, Jamaican Patois is an English-based Creole language. Uh, it has no standard and it has no recognition by the government in Jamaica, um, but it is the, the primary language of most of the people on the island. Uh, so an interesting thing about this, uh, this video was done by Daniel, one of the co-founders of Wikitongues, and he said uh, that Venetia, the speaker in the video, and he were trying to come up with word lists for Patois. And so what they did was they went back through her text messages and her WhatsApp messages to, to see uh, what word she uses because people uh, are texting each other in Patois. And this is really interesting because it's never been written before. There's never been a practice of having correspondence in this language, um, but it just happened naturally. And so people are sort of figuring out their own way uh, to commit this language to writing. Uh, even though there's no standard and no one's ever been taught how to spell things or, or how to, uh, you know, write grammatically uh, understandable patois. <clears throat> uh, another important thing for Wikitongues is to be inclusive of sign languages. Uh, a lot of times when people talk about languages and language preservation, sign languages are just sort of uh, considered other or separate or, or maybe just aren't really thought of that much. Um, so Wikitongues does have a number of videos for uh, sign language and including this one for Katakolo. So we'll just start the video. Uh, Katakolok is a sign language spoken in Bali. Um, and there are a lot of videos being made of the language in order to, to document it and perhaps in the future make didactic materials for it. Um, one of the problems is that in this community there isn't really much access to the internet. So people kind of wonder, well, what, what purpose does it really serve? Uh, but in this case, uh, all the video footage that's being taken of this language is going to be stored at an archive in the Max Planck Institute and then will be made avail available as internet um, uh, access and technology sort of becomes more uh, readily available. Um, so not only documenting uh, things now, but also anticipating uh, future needs for language materials and language documentation. Um, and then the last example is a language called Nafasana. Uh, it's spoken by a small community on Imao Island in Vanuatu. Um, Lopez, the speaker in this video, had a friend who had heard about wiki tongues and got in touch and submitted the video. Uh, he suspected that his language uh, had not been documented at all. And uh, as far as wiki tongues has found out, it, that is true. It, it's sort of gone under the radar, and so we'll just listen to a little bit. Really. 
Okay, just a taste of how it sounds. Um, and so what uh, Wikitongs has been doing, and I, I believe we've actually found someone, uh, but they, they decided um, that they would try to help Lopez and his community find an Austronesian language expert, a linguist, to actually document the language and then get them into a position where uh, they could create uh, didactic materials or record the language further. Um, and this sort of thing just, you know, wouldn't have been possible without a wide-reaching platform. <clears throat> um, so in the interest of continuing to, to widen uh, Wikitongue's platform and, and communication with different communities, um, doesn't really have anything to do with that slide, but um, we're starting to develop partnerships with different libraries around the world. So we have a partnership with the Library of Congress in the US and with uh, Queens Library in New York City. Uh, and so these are places that will, will house archives of um, current and future documentation of languages. Uh, we'll probably be able to uh, cooperate on different projects and expand uh, the work. Um, so both of us have actually contributed videos to Wiki Tongues. Uh, I've done a couple of videos of Breton speakers and a video of a friend speaking Yiddish from New York. Um, and on the Wiki Tongues uh, website, you can find a link somewhere for volunteer opportunities or a place to submit videos online. Um, this is another link uh, for anyone that's involved in any kind of Wikimedia um, work or contributions. Uh, so if you would also like to get involved, uh, you can follow this link. Um, we also have a blog that I've written for. So there's, there's a variety of different ways that people can get involved and start working with different languages that you may have contact with or that you might be interested in establishing contact with around the world. Um, so yeah, we welcome you to join the team. And uh, if you have any questions, then we'll do that now. Thanks. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Actually, we have quite many questions, and I will start with the most popular one from Pablo. And uh, Pablo is asking, is this a symbolic effort just to have a representation of every language or a real effort to document them? Uh, it would require hundreds of hours of video of each language. Um, I, as, as far as I'm concerned, there, there is some element of uh, symbolism to it in that, you know, a, a three minute video online is, is not really a thorough documentation of a language. Um, but I think what the, the important work comes in with uh, the potential for raising awareness about languages, for getting different communities in touch with each other. So when these videos appear, a lot of people end up contacting Wikitongues and letting us know about uh, language activism that's going on or different projects. And through that, I think different people have come in touch with each other. And so that, that's really where, the, um, where the, the power of the movement comes in. Um, I recorded a video of my um, classmate from the university who speaks uh, Kurdish as their first language and um, uh, I didn't have a chance to write the translation and there was another girl who wrote the translation under the video so you know we put it out there and uh, then the community uh, works with it further and uh, like yeah you, as you said as Timothy said like you, you actually never know what might happen next and what it might inspire other people to do and um, yeah, maybe it's just a small step, but it's something. <laughs> so next question, what do you think about the situation when minority or revived languages are spoken with an unoriginal accent? For example, Serbian spoken with a German pronunciation. Um, I, I'll talk about this in terms of the Irish language because that's what I'm probably most familiar with. Um, so in Ireland, you definitely do have a split between uh, native speakers who, who have you know, their own native accents and then 
there's a generation of kids who've gone through Irish medium schooling. Uh, they speak fluent Irish, but it's not, it's not uh, the same as, as native Irish. It's based on a standard. Um, the pronunciation's a bit different. And a lot of times these speakers uh, get a bit of, bit of criticism for uh, you know, not sticking to, to the original languages. And I think that's really a shame. I think that when your language is in uh, a dangerous situation, you sort of need all the support that you can get. Um, I personally uh, support flexibility in terms of like accent and pronunciation, uh, that kind of thing, for the sake of preserving the, the cultural legacy of the language. Do you have? Uh, sure. Uh, I would like to yeah, add something about the Sami language. Uh, the Sami language uh, has become endangered not because of natural reasons like, uh, you know, your parents moved to an, uh, another country abroad and then uh, like, the, yeah, the children lose the language, but it has been taken away by the Norwegian, Swedish and Finnish government and Russian government from the people. It's not the people's fault that they don't speak the language anymore and uh, they're trying as hard as they can. Now there is a big revival movement going on in Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia to, to get the language back. And uh, naturally, um, uh, a lot of those people do not have the native accent. Uh, it's quite close because uh, there are not that many, still like not that many people learning it uh, compared to other popular languages. So uh, they have quite good accents, but it's not perfect. But I think that we cannot afford to, you know, like lose the speakers to discourage people. We need every speaker that we can. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think that absolutely any, any accent is fine as long as you speak it. Uh, also, people who do not have the indigenous uh, heritage are welcome to learn those languages. Uh, what has been the reaction to Wikitangs from the other organizations that are also trying to document and save languages? Um, I'm not sure I know too much about this. Uh, it doesn't quite pertain to my involvement with the organization, but uh, for example, the uh, polyglots in Indonesia, that group, uh, didn't stem out of wiki tongues as far as I understand. It, it was already existing and now is, is a partner. So um, I know that there has been uh, some uh, willingness to, to cooperate and to, to bring efforts together. Um, uh, somebody is asking or saying that they are following you on YouTube and the Wikitangs for some time and what they think is that it lacks some form of standardization. Are you thinking about this? Uh, um, standardization in what way? <laughs> I'm not really sure what you mean. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. That's a very good question, actually. Uh, yes, you have noticed that people speak about totally different things, and we do not script. Like we don't tell um, our contributors what to say. Uh, I can, usually they're very shy when you record the video, so I encourage them to say like, uh, why don't you say why you like your native language and why people should learn it, but like that's just a suggestion for me. And uh, yeah, they usually just uh, go on speaking, but um, I think that um, that's, I don't know, I think that that's the best way to document it so that it sort of comes from them. Um, instead of them just saying a script, saying exactly the same thing all over and over again. Um, I don't know, I find it quite, yeah, I, I like the way we do it. <laughs> what do you think, Tim? Um, I think in, with some of the earlier videos, there was sort of the loose question uh, to ask the, the speaker to talk about their identity, their, their identity with their language or something like that. Um, but it hasn't really continued to be, to be the case. There are lots of videos where people talk about different things. But yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, if you have someone talking about uh, something they're comfortable talking about and that they actually have something to say about, then that's probably, you know, the, the freest form of expression that you'll get out of them. And, and I think that sort of embodies the, the spirit of Wikitongs, uh, people actually, you know, speaking from the heart. Uh, what are the biggest technical challenges you are currently facing? Um. Well, uh, if you saw the, if you notice in Anna's video, uh, I recorded it in a, at a festival. 
so <laughs> there were drums and like and a lot of people say that the sound is bad the drums are like facing around and I had no other chance to really talk to her like anywhere so the, yeah technical issues like recording in the field maybe like in a forest jungle festival <laughs> anything and um, um, yeah, like uh, sometimes not all of us have professional cameras. I just film from my iPhone, uh, so the the uh, quality of both sound and video can sometimes be. Yeah, you know it's community based, and uh, it's uh, we we're all volunteers, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't get paid for the equipment. So issues like that that can happen. And the last question: Are whistling languages or dialects also documented on wiki tongues? Um, not that I know of. Um, I know that there are whistling languages in uh, Turkey, Spain and other countries, but uh, I don't think that we have documented it yet. But if you know anyone who speaks or whistles <laughs> a language, you're more than welcome to uh, make a video and submit it on our page. Actually, we don't have more questions on Slido, but if you have any comments or questions, I may come to you. Okay. I just uh, I'm gonna try to be short. Uh, my boyfriend is from Brittany, so he doesn't speak Breton. He only speaks French, and I somehow have the impression that he hasn't lost a lot, because at first I used to think that okay, I I'm more excited about learning his language than himself. He himself. So I sometimes think even if I share your view, so what you think I think losing a language is, I also think that it can be really, maybe. It could cost a lot of money and a lot of uh, effort to rescue a language. And uh, I sometimes think maybe if it's worth it, even if I sound horrible now maybe to, to myself, even to myself, but I always wonder about it, yeah. Very shortly. I know of, uh, several languages that have, that have disappeared from uh, the, the media, for example, 20 or 30 years ago, I could listen to Platt Deutsch oh, on uh, Low German, it is, on the North Deutsche Rundfunk. That has disappeared, and now you can only hear it on radio. Have you any idea of uh, contacting those media uh, as a source of uh, informants, maybe, or something, to present small programs where you present uh, the dialect uh, or whatever as a program? Because you may have some speakers they don't have contact to or don't have thought of. That's how many programs get going in those media, at least on local TV and things like that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for what you're doing for your work. Um, as I said, I speak Walloon, and I really saw myself in the, the old lady. Um, because, yeah, when I think of my uh, Walloon dying, uh, I want to cry. Uh, I've cried many times already, by the way. Uh, so thank you just for that. Um, I have a question. What do you think of the idea of a gathering similar to this one, but for endangered, language, endangered languages? Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> um, uh, I would actually be willing to to talk about uh, how we could make that happen. I think that we would have no shortage of, of interest. Um, yeah. Um, I also think it's great, uh, but like I know a lot of speakers, native speakers of indigenous languages, especially Russian indigenous languages. Uh, what happens is that uh, people in, like in countries like Russia, unfortunately, don't have the funds to travel anywhere, and. Uh, um, you know, like also the political situation is not the best. Uh, also, a lot of those speakers, uh, they don't want to be on the camera. So uh, I know a lot more people that I could have uh, made a video with, but I didn't because they uh, didn't agree to. Uh, so it's like, it's really great, but it's a bit more complicated um, than it is also like, think of all the indigenous languages in uh, Asia, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that those people, uh, all of those people have the opportunity to travel. Uh, uh, to answer um, uh, your question um, about the uh, German, low German, right? Uh, 
Um, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's a great suggestion. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we have a lot of volunteers in Germany uh, that can uh, uh, contact the um, uh, media uh, and um, maybe figure something out. And um, uh, Santi, uh, so you were asking uh, whether it's worth preserving your language. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, like I can answer about the Sami community. Um, it's like uh, you have to understand that those people went as also as Anna said through generations uh, filled with like with emotions like shame, uh, disdain, um, uh, hatred, stigma. You know, uh, it's about like um, sometimes they are not that excited about that language because they have been discouraged. Uh, their parents and their grandparents have been discouraged and denied their identity. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, like, you know, it's like w w there are people who are excited and want to learn it, but we cannot uh, push it uh, because. Yeah, it's personal choice. Um, there was actually a uh, psychologist in Brittany, I think working in the 1970s, and he worked with a lot of older people who had seen their language die in their lifetime, and also the next generation down who, who wasn't speaking Breton anymore. Um, and he wrote uh, about the psychological trauma of language loss, even in subsequent generations. Uh, and a lot of people talk about uh, looking at statistics for France about the increased rates of depression and uh, alcoholism, suicide in Brittany versus uh, other areas of, of France and sort of um, pose questions about the link between this and, and language loss. And so I would say for an individual who, you know, maybe doesn't have particular interest in language and is mentally healthy and, you know, isn't really suffering from the loss of it, uh, from a community perspective, I think you can also make an argument that uh, uh, studies have shown in indigenous communities around the world that when uh, the language starts to make uh, more headway uh, in terms of use within the community, uh, then community rates of suicide, depression, mental illness all drop dramatically. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I am representative at the United Nations uh, for the World Esperanto Association, and we regularly uh, participate, uh, for example, in the Minority Forum. Um, we organized in 2008 uh, an international symposium. Uh, I would like to know if you, are, yes, for what you know, if Wikitongs has already some links with uh, this kind of official level, uh, if you think it can be useful and in which way and what we propose. We also have right of speech during the, the sessions. So what, what do you think about it? Not that I know of, uh, but I'm sure that uh, Daniel, uh, one of the co-founders of our organization, would be able to answer that question. So if you could uh, get in touch with him uh, via our site, I'm sure that, uh, yeah. He knows that. <laughs> um, one more? Oh, okay. Thank you for the talk. I think it's great what you guys are doing. Uh, I contributed to the Kickstarter fund and uh, the campaign, and uh, I love it. I'm, I'm, this is my thing. This is what I want to die while doing. And I'm, now I'm going to school uh, for language documentation and conservation. And just, uh, just an FYI, there are a lot of conferences that kind of talk about endangered languages throughout the world. A lot of them are really academic, so they may not be um, what everyone is looking for. But there's one in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, every two years called the ICLDC, the International Conference for Language 
documentation and conservation and it's like four or five days of talks about endangered languages and a lot of it is technical and, and, and you know very linguistic oriented but some of them are really amazing and they talk about so many different languages so I highly recommend that uh, and if you look on linguist list and do a search for conferences for language documentation you will find things all around the world so there will be things right in your neighborhood maybe so but thank you so much for this I think it's great and it's great that people are now doing these you know kind of like non-academic non-governmental ways of uh, raising language awareness. So, thank you. thank you. I'm taking this home. Thanks. Um, well, thank you for your attention. Gito. Good morning.